Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, one thing we can say about the last couple of years, the job market is nuts. I mean, we've had a great resignation, a great migration, a great termination. Who in the hell knows what's next? We've seen shrinking workplaces and an expanding mobile workforce. Two years ago, remote work was weird. It was something consultants do. And now it's not only common, it's desirable, and it's actually pretty cool. Point is, there's been a seismic shift in the job market, and recruiters and candidates are still figuring things out. Good thing we have some people here who we can rely on to help us through these crazy times, like my guest today. She's a 30-year retail executive turned recruiter who went from overseeing major retail brands like Jockey and Vera Bradley to finding exceptional talent for her clients. Now, as the CEO of Global Recruiters Low Country, a South Carolina-based consultancy, she's become a recognized leader in talent acquisition and a sought-after executive coach. I'm excited to talk about the state of recruitment, much, much, much more, with my new friend, Melissa Latham. Melissa, Hi. it's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks so much for How having me. You? That was quite lovely, quite an interview. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, you know, I mean, I, I keep saying this to people on my show, and my listeners may get tired of it, but I'm like, I don't really do much research, so the least the least I could do is write a really nice intro. And that <laughs> you, know, you did. Make sure... Make sure people feel welcome. Now, I mean, I'm joking a little bit about that. I, of course, I do. I do try to figure out, you know, what is is you know important to my guests, mm -hmm. um, and you know, try to figure out the best ways to bring all that out in my conversations. But frankly, for the most part, you know, what you hear is what you hear, and 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 I let it go. I mean, we we just, we just talk, we have conversations, mm -hmm. and usually great things happen. So, get ready for great things to happen. Okay. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How you doing? I'm really good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a, it is, it is a nice summer day as we record this. And, um, you know, I was just talking with Melissa before we started just like about the craziness of, of the days we live in. And, you know, I, I mentioned in the intro that, you know, this is a time where people are working remotely and, mm -hmm. and it's the job market seen a seismic shift. I'm one of the, one of the, either one of the benefactors of that, I'd say, mm -hmm. um, I hope, well, certainly not a victim, but definitely a benefactor. Um, and I changed jobs during the pandemic and and during that seismic shift, and and I'm happy to talk about that. But you know, one of the things about this remote work thing and working all over the place, uh, like where is when people aren't in offices, is you're just there's no such thing as a clock anymore either, right? So, so many of us are on at all different times of day, and you know, there's a a balance between owning your day and you know working hours that don't kill you. So, yeah. you know, I I uh, I, I think that. Well, I, th I think we want to talk about that a little bit, Melissa, and, and mm -hmm. I want to hear your take on that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute. I'm, I just, I'm just excited to have you on and talk about these things. Just for our guest benefit, our, our listeners' benefit, you and I met on The Connective, we which sure is did. something that, yeah, something that our listeners are hearing a lot about lately because I get great people from The Connective. It's a, it, is, it is an ever-expanding group mm -hmm. of incredible professionals who really value relationships and, and connections over simple networking. Yes. And, um, you know, Melissa, you were introduced to me like almost within a day of one another by Joe Mindak and by Karina Bell, both of whom are leaders of the connective. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really funny that, you know, I got a mail, mail from Joe saying, you, you know, you need to talk to Melissa. And then Karina said, you need to talk to Melissa <laughs> from two different angles. So, you know, the stars aligned, uh, the, the, uh, the planets aligned, whatever you want to call it. And, and I, I spoke to you right away and I was so glad I did. Because here we are. Why don't we start by, you know, I'll turn it over to you. How did you get here? So you're in South Carolina, but you had a really long career in mm -hmm. retail yep. and now you're in recruitment. So why don't you give us the top line? Sure. How did that happen? Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you mentioned, um, 35 years doing something I have an, a tremendous passion for. And, you know, and I started on the selling floor as a sales associate way back in the 80s and um, progressed all the way up to really being the president of an organization and loved it. However, you know, what I we always thought about was when I quote unquote retire, mm -hmm. I should probably get into recruiting. Um, and that's something I always had in wow. the back of my mind. And reason being is I completely attributed my any success that I had to the people I hired and the teams that I built. It was always about putting that right group of people in the right roles and creating team and sense of accountability, but also celebration. And I love that part. Um, I think it's at, at the very core of who I am. And again, it, it delivered that success. So I thought that that's what I would transition to one day when I retire. And then COVID hit. <laughs> Oh. Um, 
Yeah. And that yep. kind of accelerated all of this. We had lived all over the country. I'm from New York originally. I left in the 80s. I've lived in the South. I've lived in the Midwest. And um, I was in Chicago in February of 2020. And I found myself thinking about what will I do next? My role um, at Jockey had ended. And I really got to be thoughtful about that next step. And I decided not to continue to keep doing what I had been doing. I felt I reached a pinnacle. I accomplished everything I wanted to. And I thought maybe now this is the time to pivot. And I was always kind of gun shy throughout my corporate career thinking, well, that's got to be really hard. And then how do you handle all the other you know, great benefits that a corporate office gives you? What do you do with your health insurance? I always got hung up on that for some reason. How do you handle health insurance? How do you start all over? But something about it felt very appealing. And I decided that if I had driven success over the past 35 years doing everything I did, why couldn't I be successful doing this? And that's then I just took the leap. And so launched the office. We're actually two years old this month. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. I'm really excited about it. And I continue to focus our executive search firm in the retail industry because it's my love, it's my passion, but it's also this network that I've built over years and years and years before LinkedIn was ever even invented. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was writing people's name down in a little black notebook and anybody who ever worked with me and for me knows about the little black notebooks, right? Here's yep. who I met today. Here's who they work for. Here's their phone number. And then obviously LinkedIn came along and made that a lot easier. But I really wanted to leverage that network. And um, and we have. And we've grown. We're a team of four. So it's wow. happened pretty quickly within two years. And I have retail experts that also work on the team that I've worked with in the past. So collectively, we have 100 years in the industry, <laughs> um, three times the amount of network. And I think it's um, proven very beneficial to work with clients who know that we get it. So yeah. that's kind of what I did and how I decided to just you know, kind of like just jump in and make it happen. And all those things that you seem to be worried about, yeah. you find a way to overcome them. Well, I love the fact that you just decided to to pivot, right? I mean, I even did an episode many, many episodes ago, way early in the in the what I like to call the shitteration phase <laughs> of my of my podcast career. That was my first episode was it was shitterate was, was what it was called. <laughs> You know, you do something, you know, it's going to be crap, but you continue to do it until you mm-hmm. improve, right? Because you know you're going to improve. You have to have that mindset that's going to get better. And I did something early on about like pivoting, right? Like you just, sometimes you just need to, you need to make that change. Mm-hmm. And what is it that drives you to do that? And I think, you know, in this case, there was an externality here. You had COVID going on, but, but you had said that you were thinking about recruitment for a, quite a while mm-hmm. and, you know, attributing much of your success to your team and to the people that you work with and the magic of putting a great team together. I mean, that's a loose translation of what you said, but Mm -hmm. that's basically, it is magical, right? It is. You know, getting to that, right, to to recruitment and to even building the team, it's connected to something else you said about, you know, networking. Um, We mentioned the connective, you know, networking is such a, you know, it's such a weird term these days because I think it's, it's it's defined differently by different people, first of all. So we'll, we'll, let's let's maybe start there. But then, you know, it's different now than it was in the black book days, mm-hmm. for better and for worse. <laughs> so mm-hmm. for, first of all, what what's the difference between networking and connecting? Like, is there a difference? Or if you do separate those things, how do you do that? I, I do personally. I, mm-hmm. I think of a network is you know, a, a huge collection of people, right? That you you have some type of connectivity to, um, but it's not deep, right? Um, but you know, you could probably reach out to them on LinkedIn or maybe you could send an email and jog their memory. But I, I think it's bit more of a, a, a collection of people you can tap into. Connecting to me is intentional. And I use that word all the time. I'm very intentional about working and developing relationships. And you do that through connecting. And that's why I like the connective, Mm -hmm. our group, so much because they are very intentional about having one-on-one meetings. I have had probably 30 in the three or four months that I have joined. And you truly are seeking to learn about that person, 
their capabilities, who they are, how you can help them. They yeah. will ask you how they. So that's what I think connecting is. I think connecting is a few layers deeper, and it it really is a kickstart to a relationship. And then I would say that it it does become incumbent upon you to make that keep that relationship alive. So yeah. I, I'm one of those people that will check in with you. I will send an email and say, you know, I've really been thinking about you. How are you? I will send an email and say, can we go grab a cup of coffee? I haven't seen you in six months. That's that's where it becomes very meaningful. People remember you. They can rely on you. They trust you. But it takes work and effort mm-hmm. and intentionality. I think those two words, like effort and intentionality, are so critical. The network... I I agree with you about everything, but the network idea, I love what you said that it's like, it's, it's a collection and it's like, so you have collection versus a connection. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to use that by the way, Mm -hmm. but there's, there's this, uh, there's this whole kind of thing about how big is your network? How's, you know, you have uh, this, this person has a great network. It's going to be a great salesperson or this person's going to be a great recruiter. It's great network, great network, great network. What they don't say is this person has great relationships Mm -hmm. and that's what they should say. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Because you can burn a network really easily if you don't have the relationships right. in place. Right. And it's that depth you're talking about, that intentionality and the effort. You know, a network doesn't take any effort. Right. Really. You know, oh, I happened to show up at a place. I saw you. I collected your card. We, we had some pleasantries. Mm-hmm. Bam, you're in my network. Exactly. Right. Uh, and LinkedIn, same thing. You know, it's a, it can be passive or it can be aggressive. It can be passive aggressive. It could be anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, but um, but that whole idea of building those relationships is so important, and I agree with you. The connective does is structured so that that is yes. Not only not only does it happen; it's kind of required to happen for yes. you to be a member. Like you have mm-hmm. to continue to do that. So I, I like that that intentionality. But I was going somewhere with this. I was thinking that you know when you've in your past, like so when you had those black books, you know, and it, that that was your good, like that was your network. Uh, that you use then to build your business, how hard was it to convert those people into relationships? Or what, per, like, if you had to give it a number, because obviously LinkedIn gives you a number. Oh, I, there's like 4,000, 7,000, 8,000 connections, right. whatever. Right. But if you had to give it a number, do you know how, like, how big do you think your network was and how many of those people would you, would you, would you count as connections or as like relationships? I, you know, I, I I'm going to say it's a higher number than maybe what other people would say, mm-hmm. just because... It's, it's what I do and it's really what I enjoy doing, right? It, it's not something that I have to calendarize and, and make myself think about. It's just kind of yeah. how I've operated and I enjoy what I get back and I enjoy what I can give to others. So um, do I have a relationship with everybody that's in my LinkedIn network and my database? No, I don't mm-hmm. have that kind of, I don't have a relationship, but I, I think 50, 60% of them, I could probably tell you a lot about each person. That's pretty crazy. You know, I mean, that's a big number, say 50, 60% to me. And I, but I regret that of my own kind of like looking back to the way that I've built my, my network and my connections, Mm -hmm. you know, you can see like the ebb and flow of my intentionality and of my career, like when I was really trying to build a network and when I was really focused on relationships because you can like the speed at which you connect, you, you, you aggregate people changes, Mm -hmm. but the quality of the, I'm not gonna say the quality of the people, but the quality of the, the relevance of the connection changes. Yes. And great quality people, but completely irrelevant to me in my career now or to my life. And we have nothing in common. And, you know, I mean, I'm very happy that they may have accepted an invitation and vice versa, but it does nothing to, to me, except add a number right now. And you know, who knows? At some point in the future, they could come up in a search, and maybe I'll 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 have something to do with them. But but unlikely, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, it's it's interesting because when I think when you're writing things down in books, like going what we would call old school now, right? It's just like the black book, the roll of dexes, yeah, right. Yeah. The book of the book of in Japan that we had um we had books of business cards, you know, mm-hmm. that we. You know, we took care of like they were our babies. Right. And, you know, you put effort into that part of it. And I think each one of those names that, that was in your book and each one of those cards and each one that had a little bit more kind of, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, tangible, more tangible because it was there, but mm-hmm. 
little little more meaning and a little more depth, but you but you couldn't get the numbers that you could get now, right? Right. So right. So there's a trade off, you know. Um, I don't know when you when you moved into recruitment though, did you start to really dig more into LinkedIn or or I mean, obviously it was 2020, so LinkedIn was the tool that was mm-hmm. really available. But you know what what did you find to be like the real kind of not only advantages of LinkedIn, but like moving into the, the the digital world of connections versus the old school world of making connections. Like, what are the trade-offs in each of those? Like, you know, what did you find to be better now or worse now or better than worse then? Yeah. I, you know, I have to tell you, I've always been a big fan of LinkedIn, always. Mm-hmm. And now I live on it like it's Instagram, right? So anybody who does what I do for a living, it, it's up 24 seven, right? It's our lifeblood. Mm-hmm. So it serves a different purpose for me now as well. But, um, you know, things can happen a lot quicker to your point, right? You can connect with as many people as you could possibly click on, you know, during the course of the day. But it's really about, but what do you do with that? I, I, I don't ask people to connect with me without an intention, right? It's because you know, either I want to genuinely get to know them, I'm intrigued by their position, or I'm intrigued by the, their company, and I want to learn more. And it, it really isn't about the number. It's about yeah. what do we do with it. And and I think that's the important piece of it, right? Not connecting for the sake of connecting, because what does that do? But I'm a real big fan of it, and I always have been. So it wasn't a difficult transition for me, because I... I worked it. You know how when you're on mm-hmm. LinkedIn and you have all your messages on the side, it would yeah. probably take you all 24 hours to scroll through every message I have up and going. So yeah. um, lots of back and forth. And I go back and I talk to people I haven't talked to in 10, 15, 20 years. It's it's really kind of, I don't know, rewarding. There's something fantastic about picking up and surprising somebody that you haven't talked to in a long time. I I have two really quick examples. I was doing a search in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, 22 years ago, I was a field leader for the limited. I had a store manager who lived in Greenville, South Carolina. I found her. I picked up the phone and I called her at work. And I said, you're never going to believe who this is. And I heard her scream on the other end, right? We hadn't (laughs) heard, talked to each other in 22 years. Um, So, you know, that was awesome. And it was like an instant reconnect. And then last week, I was able to help another recruiter um, fill a really major role with somebody I worked with who was an executive at The Limited. And Mm -hmm. I recommended him. We got on Zoom. I don't look the same. He has white hair. We haven't seen each other in 22 years. (laughs) And we picked up like it was yesterday. P.S. He got the role. So there's... That's the value to me, right? Is that you you can pick up where you left off because you've done enough to keep it alive over the course yeah. of time. You know, it's interesting that what you've described is a hybrid set of actions and, you know, sh- signifies the importance of relationship beyond what's on the um, what's on your LinkedIn what's on your LinkedIn uh, network or what's in your message list, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's, I think a lot of folks just rely on, okay, I, I have this I have this list of people, whether it's LinkedIn or not, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, but I have a, a, a list of people on LinkedIn and that's how I'm going to conduct my business. But the first thing you said, when you said you, you found somebody, you picked up the phone. I mean, mm-hmm. how many people pick up the phone now? <laughs> right? Not a lot. Not a lot, right? Not so that's, that's the importance of the the human connection here. Yes. So when you're trolling through LinkedIn, you know, uh, obviously you're going to come across somebody that you want to talk to. Mm-hmm. I mean, you will pick up the phone, and yeah. you know, like right now, I think we're we're inundated with so many requests and activities and mm-hmm. and kind of uh, things that take our time. Um, through LinkedIn too, especially, you know, you, you mentioned your long list of messages. I'm in the same boat, but that's not because I have so many messages going on. It's because I'm terrible at inbox management, right? Mm -hmm. So (laughs) it's a combination of both those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I get a lot of, a lot of them is, a lot of it is really terrible stuff, like terrible, not like, not egregiously like offensive, but, but completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people using LinkedIn to pitch relentlessly, Mm -hmm. um, 
And some of those are like, oh crap, I really want to get back to this person. Or, oh, it's so good to hear from, from Mike. It's so good to hear from, from John. It's so, so great to hear from Adrian. It's like, you know, you, you, you do use it as that is your contact database. So you're constantly like, oh, you know, your friends are there. Right. Um, and you can rekindle old friendships and, mm -hmm. You know, you haven't ta talked to somebody in a few years, they'll pop up on your feed and, oh yeah, it's a reminder. That's the beauty of it all, right? Mm -hmm. But have you had a lot of issues? Have you found that that your understanding of the value of relationships, of using LinkedIn sort of as that, that in, in that hybrid way I just talked about, have you found that that's the, the exception or the norm in your business? So ask me that a different way. Have you found that, a lot of folks are trying to get use use LinkedIn for shortcuts and not creating oh, those connections. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I think so. I you yeah. know, and I wonder is is it a generational thing? Is it um people who, you know, aren't as seasoned as I am and know how to do it a different way? Um, are people just trying to rush it? You, you mm -hmm. can't rush this kind of connection and relationship building. And, and is it like a buckshot or rifle? I think about that all the time. And a lot of people use LinkedIn, like in a buckshot approach. Um, I, I don't know. And I guess you could say it's a law of numbers and you see how many people will bite, but I, I just don't think that's the most genuine way to approach yeah. it, honestly. Um, what I think it could do is it could very quickly can establish um, yes, I'm interested in talking to you. Right. And that's kind of all you need. But yeah, I'm for whatever reason, I'm curious, I'm interested, mm -hmm. I'm open for a conversation. And P.S., you'd be surprised with what my title says I do for a living. A lot of people want to talk to me, right? So oh, yeah, that, yeah. that's very helpful <laughs> that's right. as well. But I never, I never position it as a business, right? It's mm -hmm. not about, I want to talk to you about my business. I want to talk yeah. to you. I just want to talk to you. And I have many, many conversations throughout the week and even within the course of a day that are that do not land or result in business today that may down the road. But gosh, I met the neatest person or somebody who's so cool or so talented that I can't wait to be able to pick up the phone and call them back and say, gosh, I've got a great opportunity to talk to you about. But I just love the aspect of meeting people and, and I, I meet them for 30 minutes You'd be surprised how much I can find out about you within 30 minutes. And that position, of, I'm here to learn all about you. I take copious notes. I think that's something else that's really important. I take copious notes. So, uh, you know, I, I certainly have a great memory, but you can't remember everything about everybody you meet. So I want to take care, you know, capture all those nuggets about what mm -hmm. makes you unique and special and talented and different. So I think that is helpful, too. Yeah. you know, during this. So yeah, I think people can use it as a speed vehicle. I just don't mm -hmm. approach it that way. I, I yeah. try to have it come from a more personalized approach. And I think people appreciate that. Yeah. He nods his head as he takes copious notes. That's, <laughs> I, I do. Like, I, I, I agree with you. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some of those, some of those things, like people don't, people take it for granted that, oh, we're going to have a conversation and that's the end of it. But I mean, obviously we're here, we're recording, you know, but I figure that, there's so many great things that are going to be said that I would I would be doing myself and you a, dis, a disservice and certainly my listeners disservice if I didn't really kind of like, you know, take down some of the great things that you're saying. But I, I, I'm the same way. I like to take notes on people and when yeah. I talk to them, you know, it, it, and it also helps me. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a hack that helps me to listen, you know, like it helps mm -hmm. me listen better if I'm, yeah. if I know that I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, something you said was, many things you said were really interesting, but it just occurred to me as you were talking that, you know, when you, when you reach out to someone on LinkedIn, of course, your title says that, you know, you're, you're an executive talent lead, talent uh, acquisition. And, you know, that's, that is obviously, you're going to get a lot of people go, hmm, maybe I should talk to, mm -hmm. talk to Melissa. Um, but apart from that, you know, you you said that you don't start with business, right? You just, mm -mm. that's not how to build a relationship. No. Um, that's not how to start a conversation. And, you know, you're not, certainly not the first guest to say that, but I, but I like the way that you put it. And um, it got me thinking really about you know, what's the skill set that, that is missing, I think now for so many people who are like digitally native or who are trying for those shortcuts that we mentioned before, that they don't understand that one simple concept that 
it's an it's a conversation. And I was wondering if you think that that comes out of your retail background, you know, and you said it's some of it something is is a general generational thing. I agree with that too. But it's also a skill and, a, and an experience thing. So do you think your retail background helps you helped you to kind of figure that out? And is do you attribute some of your current like methodology or success to that? I do. Yeah. I, I would consider myself though a genuinely curious person about other people. Like I'm just fascinated. I could do this with you all day long. I could do this with a lot of people all day long. So I I'm just genuinely curious, but I think the the career as well, you know, I was a hiring manager in every organization I had. So mm-hmm. this is not what I do today is not foreign to me yeah. at all, right? Um, it's just more comprehensive, but it's not it's not foreign to me. Yeah. And so I think that everything that I did up until this point really positioned me to to do this. Um, five years ago, I wouldn't have been ready to do it. I th- everything happens for a reason. I truly believe that, and the timing was right. And I think all the different roles that I had and exposure and travel and, you know, I did international work. I was in Europe. I was in Saudi. I was, you know, I, mm-hmm. I was very fortunate to have the experiences that I've had. And you're meeting a lot of different people and you're managing a lot of different personalities and team dynamic. And I think the ability to, to listen, to react to people, to be curious when you need to be really helps in what I do today. But to go back to your original point, I think I started off as a very curious kind of social outgoing relationship, interested in relationships person at a very early age. And I think my career just really expanded upon that. And it's all positioned me for where I am now. And it's, you're singing my, my song, really. I mean, the whole idea of being based uh, in curiosity and being, you know, being able to, to be open and receptive to others as your default. Mm-hmm. I think uh, is is such an advantage when you're trying to build relationships. It wasn't always it wasn't always thus for me, but I I do I do feel like curiosity is what powers these conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, I really love to hear what what people have to say, and I love to hear your story in much the same way. But I I just I think that there's so much here about about being a successful relationship builder and you know, through your, through your whole career and then into now actually making it the core of your careers, these relationships. Um, and then externally to your career, you're all about relationships and connecting. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, is there a formula? Like, is there a, is there a secret sauce? We said curiosity and obviously that's an important thing, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, how can people who are not making it work for themselves on LinkedIn, let's say, for example, you know, how, what can they do? Do you have, in other words, do you have any tips or any, any, any kind of advice for people for how to really become curious or start thinking about the way to use LinkedIn properly? Right. So, you know, when I was in 2015, 18, I worked for Vera Bradley Mm -hmm. and Vera Bradley was started by two women. Um, and I worked side by side with one of the co-owners, um, Barbara Bradley Backard. <laughs> and when I came to Fort Wayne, Indiana to interview with her, she told me her phrase, which I, I think most people know is be more interested than interesting. I'll never forget that. And I don't know that that's really particular to her, but it, it is her rule. It's what she lives by. And it's not that I, I learned that the first time, but the hearing that articulated that way really stuck with me. I so like that. that's how, if you're struggling to do that, that's that would be my best advice. Be more interested than interesting, right? Talk, ask about others as opposed to talking about yourself. And it completely disarms people. So yeah. when I have interviews set up with candidates to talk about a role, I start it the exact same way, and I've done this my whole life. Um, and it's always tell me about you. What is what do I need to know about you as Dan without your career? And we'll talk about your career separately, but I want to know about you. Where'd you grow up? Tell me about family. What do you do in the weekends? What are your hobbies? What do you love to do? And they all say, Oh, wow. Okay. Like you can just feel the 
the pressure kind of rolling off their shoulders because they're prepared for this very kind of, you know, studious interview. And once you let people talk about themselves, A, you're going to learn something that you have in common. It happens every single time I do it. You're going to find something you have in common. And it also helps you kind of understand where they're coming from. And and there may be some key triggers there. So be more interested than interesting. And if you're not, if you're connecting for the sake of connections, you're missing the, I think the power of that tool because you, it gets you there a lot quicker. You can find people wherever you need to find them as opposed to, you know, me and my little black notebook walking the mall. That, yeah. <laughs> my audience was who was there that day, right? So now the world is at your fingertips. But I, I would just, you know, encourage people to think about, now what are you going to do with them? Yeah. You have these connections. People said, okay, I'll connect back with you. Now what are you going to do with that? It's, I, it's, a priv- it's a privilege, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's an honor. Yes. Yeah. I yes. think that what, people forgot that somewhere along the way. Um, people will talk to you. That's the, that's the other thing is, you know, you don't use, I pick the phone up all the time. I live on the phone, but people will talk to you. And, and because a, either they're curious too, or they want to be heard or what they want to, they just want that connection. So take the risk, you know, just jump off and do it, pick up, ask for their number. What's the best number. Can I call you? Are you busy next week? Can we do coffee over zoom? Um, so you can still do it with technology and you can still be comfortable and, and it just doesn't have to have a, a beginning, a middle and an end. It can just yeah. be a dialogue. Some people are really scared of that though, right? Yeah. Like I, I think back to my time as a recruiter and, you know, I've mentioned, we talked about this when mm-hmm. we first chatted a while back, but, you know, I had a short and I want to say, let's just put it this way. I had, I was a recruiter. <laughs> I, didn't have, I, I can't, I don't want to qualify it with a particular word. I mean, I had a great time and then I didn't have a great time. And then I had a great time and I didn't have a great time. It was like kind of this up and down thing, yeah. but I was not successful as a recruiter for the first, for a while. And then I was a little bit, then I was, then I just wanted to get out. And I think that fundamentally I had, a, I was afraid of having those conversations like I, I think back, I was a lot younger, but I think back, like I was afraid of having those conversations. Maybe it was fear of rejection. Maybe it was a belief mm. system I held that, okay, nobody wants to talk to me because, you know, this is about money and money is not like, if I'm going to call you and, and suddenly turn you into my product, ew, yuck. You know, like it's, it's sort of, you, it's a, it's a stupid mindset to have, honestly, because it just, you know, it doesn't make sense. People you're doing, you're doing a good service for folks and for yourself. And there's no reason to shy away from it. By the way, anybody who's out there pondering a career in recruitment, money, yuck, is a terrible way to think about money. It's yeah. fine. You are, yeah. You're rewarded for make, for doing a very valuable service. Yes. So regard anyway, like back when I was recruiting, I, I, re, I remember like I had to start off, this is right at the early days of the internet. So we're talking the, you know, late nineties and- you know, I had a, I had a database in front of me, and I was like, you know, I was tasked to call all these IT professionals in a particular area, and you know, I knew, didn't know the first thing about IT, and um, you know, I was representing a company, and I really wish that I had known that people do want to talk to you, mm-hmm. and that I'd never that I didn't feel the pressure to kind of turn this into a database entry, mm-hmm. right? Um, now, you know, back in those days, maybe it's still the same. I haven't seen an applicant tracking system in a long time, but, but it was, you call somebody, you put them on the database and you build the database. You put lots and lots of people in the database and you know, you need that. You need to have a, a, a good, right. And now like, what is LinkedIn? LinkedIn is a giant database of people. Right. So oftentimes it's there for you already. But anyway, before LinkedIn, before social media, you're building your own database. And I remember talking to people and thinking, this guy doesn't want to talk to me. This woman doesn't want to have anything to do with me. You know, she knows I'm trying to sell her on something. We talk about a bad, unproductive mindset, right? I mean, that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then things changed a little bit and I got a little bit better at it. And then the internet came around. Then it became real easy to place people for a short time because the market went really well. And then I confused the ease of placement with skill in my job, which is two different things, right? I'm, I'm really zooming through the story. But ultimately in the end, I just, I just figured, you know what? I, I really, I really liked, 
I liked recruitment. I didn't like recruiting. So I stayed with the industry for a while, um, but moved into the corporate side of it. And, and I, I, I really felt it was a rewarding time in my life. Um, but um, the curiosity, you know, like putting curiosity first, putting people first. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't wise enough at the time to, to, to let things play out, mm -hmm. to listen. Mm -hmm. And if I could go back to my younger self and say, what you need to do is shut up, listen. Right. And that would change everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, in, and I think it's a big problem right now um, on any of these platforms. I don't think that's changed, right? So when you, you know, when you are talking about it, making that phone call and picking, you know, pick, picking up, um, pick up the phone or, or just shooting out a message on LinkedIn, you know, to start that conversation, you know, I think it takes a certain amount of bravery for some people to do that, mm -hmm. you know, but anyway, you get to this, you get to the flip side of that, which is you get these really terrible messages from people who, who like, like I was when I was 27, you know, and you know, immediately there's a stink on it. Like, oh gosh, <laughs> you know, so, so how much of that do you get every day? And do you see on LinkedIn every day? Tons, right? Yeah, I get, I get a fair amount. And I think, especially now because I'm a business owner, right? So now I'm the target of everybody who wants to help me be, you know, better at what I do or have a different system. And, you know, I really, I don't need more than what I have. I have great operating systems and access to everything I need. So that feels disingenuous, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's all about the product. Um, and it's never about, you know, I use the term, how can I be of service? And, and yeah. that's, it's always, can I, how can I be of service to you? And because that can mean a lot of different things. I can be an ear. I can be a trusted advisor. I can be a partner. I can be your recruiter. I, I, I can be a lot of things. Um, but most things that come my way like that, that you're referring to, are very targeted about a, a specific product. And it becomes an immediate no for me. I, I just, I can't even yeah. get past what your product is to even think about having a dialogue with you because of the way that it's approached. I think a lot of that is automated too, right? I mean, Oh yeah, and, oh, you can yeah. do that, yeah. And I've seen and I've spoken to people who extol the virtues of a certain degree of automation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, you know, I, I, they're not wrong. Um, but at a certain point, the person on the other side of that automation knows it's, it's automated. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's a tricky game to play to try to, to try to rescue that and turn that into something meaningful when you start with no, when you start with just a name, Yes. you know, right. mm -hmm. starting the right way is pretty important, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I, I, I think this, this whole idea of, of being curious, of listening first, having the right mindset, understanding, you know, that it's a person over there and, and, yes. you know, people are, have important things to say is, is mm -hmm. so it's so important to just being a recruiter, which kind of brings me to my, what I wanted to ask you earlier. And, and, you know, I just look like, I love talking about recruitment. So I, I get, I go off on these tangents, but I wanted to ask you about the market really. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so here we are. It's, uh, I started off by talking about the great resignation, the great migration, the great everything. And you've actually, you know, you started your business in the midst of all this mm -hmm. chaos. Mm -hmm. I think that gives you a little bit of an advantage. You know, because you didn't have the conventional wisdom to toss. You just came in and started building. Right. So how, what's it been like for you? And how are you seeing the market evolve? And and from your, even comparing to your time as a hiring manager. Yeah. When you, through your, through your lifetime, of your, for your career. Mm -hmm. Like, how are you seeing, like, what are, what are the big differences that are happening now with the way candidates and hiring managers are behaving? A lot yeah. to unpack there, but yeah. It, yeah, I was gonna say that's a really good question, <laughs> right? And again, my perspective, yeah. my perspective on mm -hmm. um, the search side of it is really only two years old, but I can I can definitely lean into being the hiring manager. I think everything pivoted because of COVID. Yeah, uh, absolutely everything changed, and I think it changed immediately because I experienced it myself. Yeah. When February of 20 came and I found myself thinking, OK, what is next? You know, the phones weren't ringing like they always did. Uh, and so that was kind of like my first clue. And of course, the world was shutting down. But I think one of the greatest benefits that came out of it is the way and the speed at which an organization can make a decision now. 
Mm-hmm. And the different work styles that you mentioned also, because this would never have been considered acceptable previously. People had to be in the office. It was like um, a sin that you would need to work from home for a doctor's appointment. It was just, you know, whatever that was, it was not the norm. And the speed in which we made decisions took months and months. Mm-hmm. We needed stakeholders and we needed a, we needed meetings and we had to think about it and we had to circle back and And all of a sudden we were making decisions, you know, took two months, it's now two days. So I think that's the real positive that came out of what we went through and the fact that we really proved to ourselves that people can work remotely and we can be as productive, if not more productive. So the Mm -hmm. way that we work has changed. And that really led to people prioritizing their lives differently and what's important to them when we, I think, you know, I, I'm part of the generation too. You work a lot. You just work a lot. You put in a lot of hours. You're traveling. You're just constantly working, especially if you're at the executive level. And that almost had a value to it. Mm-hmm. And and now that's not the case. And people really put their lives and their families first. So their jobs become not less important, but secondary to that. And that shows up in how, especially at the candidate level, in what's happening there. I very rarely, very rarely ever talk to a potential candidate that does not have two, three, four things cooking at one time, Hmm. right? They're never just talking to me and they don't have other opportunities. So there's this like investigation that goes on. Uh, And I don't remember it to be like that previously. It was, you know... You know, if you're being recruited or it's usually you have one opportunity and you're doing your due diligence behind that and you're really considering that. But now it's multiple. So people are being thoughtful and they're playing one against the other. And this, you know, wanting to be remote or needing to be remote will automatically eliminate you if you're a company that doesn't offer that in their consideration set. Yeah. It just happened again to me today. It happens every day they want wonderful this fantastic job but when you get down to it but yeah but i want to work from home and and so i can't consider this melissa it might be everything that i want but if i can't work remotely if i can't manage my time if i can't be here or there on a laptop then i can't move forward with that opportunity are our companies your clients really understanding that balance shift that shift of power in some ways It's been an interesting dialogue. I have (laughs) clients that are completely remote, have, you know, sold, I've gotten out of their real estate, which is a huge P&L expense, right, to carry. Mm -hmm. So they've gotten out of it. They figured out how to operate remotely and maintain their culture because that's important. And they're terrific. I have some that are 100% back in the office because they just went right back to what they were doing before. And they believe that that's best for their company. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that can be a little bit more challenging to find candidates, but there are people who value that. And then you've sure. got the people in the middle that say hybrid is OK. Yeah. A couple of days in, a couple of days out. We're OK with that. So it's almost like a third, a third and a third if I was to divide it up. Really? Yeah. Of who yeah. I've been working with over the past couple of years and, and what they what they expect. Are you primarily focused in the senior level, though? I mean, at the that t- top level of executives at this time, or I do, do you c- go across? Um, I do predominantly work in corporate and C-suite. But even mm-hmm. at the corporate level, you know, I, I will work on specialist roles, manager roles, director, mm-hmm. VP, and above, and use some field leadership also. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of broad. And I think that the the more mid-level management are the ones that have really decided, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to be, I value what my time and my family and I need to be remote. And, And they're less flexible. And I don't say that in a demeaning way. Yeah. They have made up their mind that they they've gone through a shift and this is how they want to operate, go forward. And because they've proven that they can be productive working remotely during the shutdown or what have you, it's very hard to tell them anything else, right? Yeah. Because they know that this works for them and they're productive for the organization. It, it's in some ways like you'd think that it would be the younger generation that would be like, no, no, I want to work remote. I want to be, you know, I want to be out there. I want to work wherever I want to, you know, I'm, I, 
I'm entitled, me, me, me. I'm sorry, I don't mean to de- I don't mean to degrade the the uh, young millennials or the Gen Zs. Right. Although I do, I do sometimes do that. <laughs> uh, but you know, because you know, I'm 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 very solidly Gen X. But I, I um. I think what you're saying, it sounds like what you're saying is it's actually, that's not the case, that that it's really the middle managers, the the people who have families or who have roots, um, you know, that really are valuing their, their kind of finding that balance between, I hate to say work-life balance because it's not really real, but whatever their own kind of personal um, kind of mix is in yeah. work and life. And yeah. they don't want to move, yeah. Yeah, I even have... Um some fantastic people I've been working with recently in a, in a very, very, very senior level capacity um, who have said the same thing to me. So, yeah. it, it, you know what? I, I don't know if it's phase of life more so than age. I think it might be mm-hmm. phase of life. People with younger Makes children, sense. you know, they want that flexibility. So yeah. that has become um, a conversation that we never had before. And it, it, I'm, I'm impressed with how determined those candidates are to make that happen for themselves. And they feel very empowered and they're very determined um, to work their work around their life. And that's interesting. It's a big switch for me to see. You know, and having been on on a a candidate several times in my life and certainly a, certainly a hiring manager on, on occasion as well, but like, I think to the times when I jumped at a role because it had a great, like, cachet to it. Yes. Good brand name. Yes. And then you'd, you know, you'd get down, go through the job requirements. Oh yeah, I could do this. I like this. This looks great. Oh, it's like an hour and 45 minute commute door to door. I'm like, "Mm, is that something I want to do? And I knew, like, I knew I would hate that. I knew that would ruin my day, but you know, what are you going to do? So I took the job, right? right? And, and was miserable. Miserable, and I was I, that misery from the commute would would overflow into the day. And I'm not saying I I'm not saying I didn't love the job because of the commute, but it would have been nice mm-hmm. if I didn't have that part of the day weighing me down. And who knows, I might have I might have gone in a different direction with that particular company at the time. Mm-hmm. Things are so it's and that wasn't that long ago, right? Mm-hmm. Now that very same company, like eighty percent remote workforce. Yeah, and I'm not that re- I mean I'm remote. I, you know, from, from New York, I'm to an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes, right? Mm-hmm. From Philly, 45 minutes an hour. What, what would have been considered commutable before, but now nobody wants to make that commute. Oh no. Oh no. You, you know? You're so right. Yeah. Well, that takes time out of their day again. So now you balance that up against, do I want to spend two, three hours commuting or can I put that into my work? Right. Because again, we've proven to ourselves, we can do this. Yeah. Or my health. Exactly. Right. I mean, right. I see, I see Stress, people like, health, yeah, gas money to these days. I'm never going back to an office because I now I can work out in the morning. Yeah, but the office has a gym. No, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I like, you know, I got, I, I like to get up and I like to work out, or I like to sleep in an extra four, five, forty-five minutes. You know what? It's made a world of difference to my day. I'm hearing mm-hmm. these stories a lot. Yeah. And I, I, as a hiring manager now, so you know. Like I would have, I, when I was a candidate, I would have really appreciated that that remote option. But as a as a hiring manager now, I love the remote work situation, mm-hmm. and because I, I happen to be with with a company that has that globally for all for all roles within the company for which this is appropriate. Obviously, like we're a big manufacturer, so like if you're working in the line, you can't, you can't you can't build something on right. a line from home, mm-hmm. unfortunately. But for those of us in corporate roles, if you can be productive, we've and we've proven that we can be. Why would why would the company why would I as an employer want to impose a hardship on you, my great great employee teammate worker that's going to reduce your productivity, right. make you unhappy, right? And still, I'm going to get the same exact work product. I mean, I'm, nothing's going to change about the work product. Mm-hmm. The only thing that changes is you got to spend more of your time going to a certain place for what that for what part? Obviously, you like to have in person meetings every so often, because as much as I love looking at you on the screen, Melissa, I know that if I saw you in person, you know, it would, it would just be a a level deeper and, you know, instantly a little bit more like human. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say that we can't build a great relationship this way because we can, but you know, you want to get everybody together in a room. You want to see the body language, hear the size, 
you want to say, hey, you know, uh, you know, go get yourself a cup of coffee. I can see you're upset. You, you know, you want those human interactions mm-hmm. to happen. Mm-hmm. So like what I'm aiming for with my team is that hybrid approach. But when we say hybrid, it's not, it's, there's no particular requirement to go to an office any number of days. It's, it's an unstructured hybrid where, where, you know, Hey, I respect, I respect you and my company respects all of you to do your job where you can do your job best. And you know what? Every once in a while, we're going to have an in-person meeting because you know what? We just need to know each other better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to collaborate. We need to have a whiteboard. We need to have whatever. Mm -hmm. So those, those every once in a while, white things are only every once in a while. And People love it. I yeah. think it's keeping people alive and happy. You know, and I was—I wonder how the heck we functioned before this. Because we didn't know any differently. I almost said yeah. better, and it, it yeah. may be better. It's—I I reflect on that a lot because everything that we've all experienced in the corporate world and being in an office and commuting—I did it. I commuted five hours a day from Philadelphia to Manhattan. I did that, <sighs> so that was crazy, horrifying. But I wanted to do the job, right? Mm-hmm. So you kind of. At that time, you prioritize the job, the experience, what you're going to learn, your exposure over the hardship that you had to go through to get there, because that's kind of the way we were brought up. And that's just what we yeah. did. So like there was never an alternative or an open to listen to an alternative until the world kind of forced us all to act in that alternative. Yeah. You can't unknow what you know now. Like, yeah. You, you just can't unknow it. I mean, and, and to, to be fair, Technology is a big enabler of this. I mean, yep. even five years ago, if I had wanted to work remotely all the time, I mean, I probably could have, but it wouldn't have been as smooth. You know, it wouldn't have been as, as instantaneous, easy, mm-hmm. you know, reliable. So, you know, technology does help like tremendously yes. for this. But but do you think that this is going to continue? I mean, let me kind of put a little context around that. The We talked about the great resignation, the great migration. Now some I've I've heard some I've heard the great termination or the great rejection. There's all these different greats happening, right? And partly due to the economic situation we're facing, um, you know, the headwinds are pretty strong, but also just because a lot of people uh made these choices Mm -hmm. during the last couple of years and had so much power over the employer because they're entertaining multiple offers. Mm They join these companies for, you know, let's say overblown rates, some high over market rates. And, you know, not in not all cases, but in many cases, I think a lot of the employers are having buyer's remorse and like, geez, I'm paying this person so much money, but I'm not getting anything more out of this person than the next person over. Um, and they don't even seem that excited about it. And then from the flip side, the candidates, the people who took those jobs are like, man, do is this, you know, I, 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 sh- I chase the money. Is this really what I want to do? You know, but the market's tightening, you know, who knows? So the point is that is the, ba- I'm, I'm wondering if the balance is shifting and do you think that, and if you think that, um, that the balance of power is going to remain with candidates for a while or not? I do. I, mm-hmm. I, I do for kind of the immediate future, just from my experiences and what candidates are sharing with me. And I know that companies are struggling to find great people. I hear it all the time. And though I'm fortunate that my clients call us continuously to continue to fill roles for them and help build their team, but that says something, right? So there is a struggle out there to find exceptional talent to fill these roles. And, And again, I think because Candidates can be very thoughtful about their next move. They 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 can. And, you know, I I experience even sometimes people will sign an offer letter and and give their commitment. And then they don't take the role. They took another one. Ooh. Yeah. So well, that, um, now, now we're crossing the boundary into some ethical <laughs> issues, right? Yeah. I mean that that was yeah. that's yeah. But it happens. Yeah. It happens because um you know, and they're not always going to be up front. And we do our very best to try to just understand, you know, how can we re- be respectful of any other potential offer they may have coming their way from a timing perspective. Mm-hmm. But people are not always going to share everything that they have going on, right? They hold their yeah. cards close to the vest sometimes. And it's it's always great when they do. But I do I do think candidates, for the most part, are going to continue to, to be the driving force 
for a little while. I do. Yeah. You know, it's funny you said that about the, I mean, it's funny, haha, maybe funny, funny, weird, not funny, haha, like that the the idea of of walking away from offer letters and you know that and it's and it's connected to can, candidates having the power obviously that person knew mm-hmm. they had they could have their pick um but there's there's a an ethical or moral dilemma i think you know a lot of these especially and it's not always younger people it's just people in the market who you know are not considerate they're not thinking about you know the other people on the end, other end of that offer. And it, it's always a, Hey, what's, what's in it for me. Yeah. And you can't, you can't filter those people out, unfortunately, you know, but my, I had a, I had a, a, a mentor early, early in my recruitment days. And he said, I'll never forget. He said, he said, Dan, you know, why are you worry about this kind of stuff? Anything can go wrong as long as people are involved. That's right. That, that was his, so right. That was his statement. Was yes. Like, ever since then. Yep. Like, like expect anything. Expect the unexpected. Yeah. Don't be surprised when it happens. It can be very unpredictable. And and going from A to Z is not a straight line, right? Sometimes you go forwards and backwards. But, you know, you're dealing with people's emotions and thought processes yeah. and everything else they have going on in their life. Yeah. Um, and the same thing true for companies. Companies are just made of people who have the same yeah. Exact same issues, thoughts, opportunities, things going on in their life. And so it's it's really how do you manage both sides of the equation? And, you know, this goes back to if you're great at building relationships and establishing trust early on and you become people's advocates, the company's advocate, as well as the client and, you know, help guide as best as you can, but always make sure that it's the best for both sides, it, it will work out well. Right. But mm-hmm. you have to, you have to be again, intentional and mindful on how you guide the process. Cause it is a process. It's and, funny how that works. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's funny how that works. Like, <laughs> yeah. like imagine that you, you build trust, you build a, a, a connection that yeah. is worth maintaining. And guess what? People will not fuck you over. Right. Right. It's, <laughs> right. you know, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry for the F bomb here at the end of the, this thing, but that's like, that's what comes to mind with, you know, these situations where people just drop out or, or just run away. Like if you have those relationships in place, you're mm-hmm. totally right. You know, mm-hmm. that, that is, that's the core of everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, whether you're hiring somebody, whether you are, you know, trying to onboard a new client or, mm-hmm. or sell something or whether you're team building, right. it's always that person to person trust. That's, mm-hmm. that's critical for everything. Mm-hmm. So um, I was going to say, that's just such a great, full circle way to kind of bring us back towards the beginning of our conversation. I, but I did want to ask you and give you, give you enough, enough of a platform here to say, you know, and we just touched on it a little bit that in the short term, at least candidates are, are, um, are still going to kind of maintain the power, but where, where do you think the industry is going and where's you, where, where are you going with it? Like, what do you see in the near, in the, in the mid to near to mid future for, for you, Melissa? Yeah, for your company. Well, well, thanks for asking. I, I am continued, excuse me, I am excited about our continued growth. Like I said, we're just two years old. We're a team of four. Um, it, it just started as a team of two. My husband's actually my business partner. So Ooh, that's the first good. time we've ever done anything like that. We have very distinct roles. I'm the voice and face of the client, the candidate, and he's the behind the scenes research and administration. And, um, you know, I think our, our growing client base has really warranted the two consultants that we have brought on. It is my intention to continue that. I, you know, we, I really do believe in the service that we provide. Mm-hmm. A lot of organizations do not have talent acquisition or they have HR, but it's very much a time consuming process to do what we do. And that's, we have the time that organizations don't. And we have the network and the tools to be able to identify those people. And our experience in the industry of a long, long time has also given us this great, I think, filter to really help identify the right people for the right roles for the right organization. And so I really do believe in the value that we bring. And I do believe it is a service that a lot of companies just don't have the time or the uh, sometimes fortitude or the tools to really do. And um, I think it's a much smoother process. 
when you utilize a firm like ours that specializes and it's really our pleasure. It's where we find, it's where I find my joy. My joy now is the perfect candidate in this amazing role in company. Oh. And when they both say yes to each other, like that is, that is the greatest thing for me just to see their smiles and to know that both sides are genuinely thrilled about moving forward. Spoken like a true connector. <laughs> It's funny. It's, it's, it's just, it's funny because I had words with Karina to that effect when we were talking and I'm talking about Karina Bell folks, like Karina, Karina and I were talking about this and it's like just the, the idea of just putting one person together with another and just, it works mm -hmm. is motivation enough. It's yeah. it, whether it's and the fact that you can do it for a living is mm -hmm is pretty remarkable in this world of ours, right? What, I mean, what a, what a world we live in. Right. But just that whole idea that this person did not know this person mm -hmm. and by the virtue of me going, hmm, I think that there's something there. You put them together and well, next thing you know, like you have a whole, you've created a whole new relationship yep. and whatever comes out of that, mm -hmm. you know, is just because you had an inkling that this would work. Right. I was... I was on the, um, just a quick story. I was on the phone um, yesterday. I was, I was talking with uh, uh, my friend, Chrissy, who used to work for me. And uh, she was my employee for, for several years and one of the best people who's ever uh, worked, uh, you know, for me. Uh, I say for very loosely because, you know, I was the boss, but clearly she had the run of the show. But anyway, <laughs> Chrissy was, was fantastic to work with. And, you know, uh, she eventually left the company. We had, I, I left the company years later, she left the company, but I introduced her to a few people. And, you know, through those introductions, um, she uh, was, you know, I don't know if she landed her current job because of those introductions, but she stayed connected to those people I connected them with. So here I am, I connect with her now. I, I just, I reconnected with her, you know, yesterday after, after quite a long time, not speaking. I hadn't spoken to her in a year or so. Um, we'd been in touch every now and then. But it turns out that those folks that I had introduced her to, well, she hired one of them as her, you know, at, to, to work as an external agency for her in her new role. Mm -hmm. And she's in a position to help another do something. Like, so it's like all these things happen just because you know you have one good person, another good person. Right. You know, one plus one equals seven, whatever yes. the formula is. Yes. So I, I'm I'm totally on board with, with what you said there. Um, and I I I identify or empathize or sympathize, whatever you want to call it with, um, with that feeling, you know, of magic happening when yeah. you put two people together Yeah, and, you know, you create fantastic. impact. Yeah. That's right. You create impact by connecting. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. that's the secret of connections is con like good connections do create something. Yes. You know, it's not just a zero something. It actually right. creates something, some mm -hmm. value, some impact, uh, something to dig, in, dig into next time, I think. Um, okay. so Melissa, this has been a pleasure. If anybody wants to find Melissa, you can, you can uh, find her on LinkedIn, Melissa Latham. Her name will be spelled properly in the episode title. Um, go to, uh, grnlowcountry.com, uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for her recruitment firm and to find more information about her. Um, is there any other place that they should look Melissa to find out more about you? Um, you know, LinkedIn's probably your best. Um, mm -hmm. I also have MRL consulting, so I do mm -hmm. some executive coaching. Um, I also do a lot of LinkedIn work. I can help people with how they can appear on LinkedIn as oh, well. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Um, but yeah, happy to chat with anybody. Send me an email. Give me a call. You can drop your resume or a note to me on my website. And I would just be happy to meet you and learn all about you. And I can't tell you, uh, I can't recommend that more uh, or strong enough to to go and meet Melissa. I mean, what a, what a wonderful person, what a great conversation. And um, she cares about everybody she connects with. It's very clear. Uh, and obviously she's given me such, such a generous amount of her time tonight. So I want to thank her so much. Thank you, Melissa. Oh, my pleasure. Um, and um, we will, we'll do this again sometime. Okay, I would love to. Thanks a lot. Thanks. 